Welcome to Crushgasm, the podcast dedicated to the highs and lows of crushes. From their first to their worst, we're going to cover them all with a cascade of characters, including our guest today. Someone who knows that when life looks kind of weird, you can always just close your eyes and make believe, and you can be anywhere. Danny, Prince AC, an actor, comedian, advocate for LGBTQ plus and plus size people of the world, and the CEO of Funny Gay Besties, who is here to talk not only about his experiences being a plus size actor in Hollywood, typecasting issues, and how the Big Fig Collective is working to make the entertainment industry do better, but also an iconic crush on none other than Kermit the Frog. Danny, how are you? Hi! Oh my god, I saw you slip in that Muppet Babies. That, I was like, when the world looks kind of weird, like you were like, right? I heard it. <laughs> yeah. It's one of my favorite uh, animated theme songs, too. Just so, I mean, like theme a- songs in general. I would say it's up there for me. My absolute favorite animated theme song is Gummy Bears, though. Oh, Gummy Bears? Like, I, it goes so hard, and it does not have to. It is that, like... Just oh. even the beginning part when it's like <laughs> magic and mystery. I'm like, I'm sold. I mean, talk about a theme song that really outshines the show, though, for me. Because when I got Disney yeah. Plus, I went to watch and I was like, mm, not as great as it used to be. Well, it used to be good, though. I used to look forward to it. Maybe because it is one of the theme songs to come on. Yeah, I think it's that. It's really, it's very much that. But before we dive into this crush, can you tell people where they can find you online? Yeah, you can find me at What's Up Danny on Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr, uh, Snapchat, BlackPeopleMeet.com, JDate, Farmers Only, uh, Venmo, and Ashley Madison. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I once I wrote for this one site. It was like all the different dating sites that are like unusual, and I there's so many. There's no excuse to be lonely. There's a dating site for everyone. <laughs> I don't really like the dating sites. I'm see, I'm more of like a Candy Crush person than like a Grinder person. <laughs> like maybe if they had like Mandy Crush, that might be good. Like I need that. I like the guy from Candy Crush. It's like excellent. You know, it'd be really <laughs> cool if like he would help me date. Like if they're like, oh, um, this guy is asking you for coffee, and it's like fantastic. It's like, Here's a picture of my butthole, juicy. Like that's what I need. Like just somebody really, you know, motivating me along. Well, there we go. You need to market Mandy Crush and get it out there for the world because there's people that, I mean... Are you listening, sharks? Are you listening, sharks? (laughs) Sharks, we have an idea for 50% of this company. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm sorry, Kendra, for that reason, I am out. (laughs) (laughs) So the Muppets, very much like The Simpsons for me, an entity that has been around for what seems like forever, and it shows no signs of going away with that you grew up watching kermit on things like sesame street and movies like the great muppet caper but the crush didn't really solidify until the muppet babies which i totally understand because muppet babies actually my favorite iteration of the muppets but for you what caused the crush to form on little kermy well when i seen the muppet babies i was like wow he's been with his friends and with his girl like this whole time this guy's like a loyal cat for a frog so that's something that's you know that's something that really kind of like inspired me. I just I like that. I always like how Kermit also was always down for a show and always trying to put a show on, but he didn't need to be the focus of everything. He wanted to include his friends. He wanted to be like like he want, this is like my perfect man. He wants to like rally people together to have fun, but he's okay with like other people shining in the spotlight. But then reluctantly, if they throw him on stage, he's in his element and he loves it. I like that he's like a ride or die, but he doesn't have to be the shining star. He's, he lifts he's, you up. Yeah, for, for someone who is like the main, has, I mean, there's, there, there's very little uh, other people that have more main character energy than Kermit. I mean, if you think of the Muppets and you're like, who's the main Muppet? Everyone's gonna say Kermit, mm-hmm. you know? But for main character energy, he's not a narcissist. He is really open to like allowing other people, you know, he's, he's, uh, He's, he's a big thinker, you know. He's like, why are so many? Why are there so many songs about rainbows? He's always thinking, what's on the other side? Like, he like, I'm like, wow. He's like existential. Like, and it, it actually was probably some of my deepest thoughts as a child were thoughts that I was having because I was watching Sesame Street. Interesting. Made you a deep thinker, those Muppet babies. But thinking back, was this like your first like big crush on, we'll say, like a celebrity of sorts? For sure. I think, it, first of all, it was my first like BTS backstage look at like showbiz, like, mm. and what that meant. And he was the one that was in charge. And, you know, he, he thrived off of the chaotic energy, but at the same time was the one that always pulled it all together. And everyone always ran to him with problems. I, I respected him a lot, you know? They Mm -hmm. say, you know, you want to be with the type of, you know, be the man you want to be with. Um, That's kind of the thing. I want to be Kermit. 
And I want to be with him. He's so cute. <laughs> he, a great person. Well, frog to strive to be like. He is just, I like I said, he's an icon. But I was just talking to uh, someone by the name of Brittany High about her Saturday morning cartoon crush on Michelangelo from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And <sighs> she said that she was kind of made fun of for this crush. Were you open about your crush on Kermit? I got to be honest. I'm into Michelangelo too. Maybe I'm a green queen. Maybe oh. I just like, maybe I like green people. <laughs> <laughs> like that's my fetish. Because <laughs> Michelangelo is awesome. He ate pizza. He was like the horniest one out of all of them. Like you could just tell. He like, you know, I, I'm maybe, I don't know what's going on. I have to like start rethinking everything now. Who else is green? Shrek. He's kind of cute. <laughs> like, <laughs> like. Okay. Although I don't like, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. And I don't know. Shrek, maybe the least, but although Shrek and Fiona have a true love, I need a true love. Like that's what I'm looking for. This is what I'm, I need, I need a, like a, like a OTP. Like I need to be like a one true pairing. Like I need that. But were, were you open about this hopeful one true pairing with Kermit back in the day or were you keeping it look, on it? Look, Kermit always liked the thick pig. So I'm like, Hey, let's go for it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and you know, Miss Miss Piggy would had to be the center of attention all the time. Look, there's even some spousal abuse allegations, which we won't touch on allegedly. But <laughs> I've like, I, but I, I, you know, I, there's been a couple of high yas or two that have been released over the years. But I tell, but I tell you, like, I still respect. He, you know, I, I, the, he's he's perfect. He's just the right amount of like cheerleader and boss. You know, because <laughs> because uh, because at some point, you know, he, I, he also I'm a fiery Italian. And at some point, you know, when everybody's going crazy, you know, Kermit will be like, Quiet! <laughs> and like, really like, like get everybody to, you know, and then of course, Janice will keep going and be like, so you said like, mom, it's my life. And if I want to work on the beach, naked, you know, but like, other than her, like everyone listens to Kermit. He is, like you said, he's the leader of the pack. And he's ride or die. He's been there since they were at Nanny's house. I, I think they were just being dropped off there. I didn't know if they lived there full time. I was kind of confused by that aspect of the show, but it didn't matter. I it felt like kids. daycare energy. It felt like daycare energy or family energy. Like maybe mm -hmm. she was some auntie kind of character. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It wasn't important. It was really about the... It, like, and I think when you're a kid and you're a bunch of kids hanging out, you don't care how your parents know each other. You're like, it's us. We're friends. Like, you know, we're family. We're cousins. Whatever. Like, it had that energy to it. I, I just respect him. I mean, especially starting off as a reporter. You know, he's he's battled wing, crazy winds. And, you know, he's, he's battled all kinds of things. Like, I'm sure he's got some kind of Pulitzer or something. Like, and then, and, you know, um, after that, like, parlaying that into, like, a major variety show during the height of variety shows. I mean, not many people could do that kind of a crossover. And then becoming a movie star and recording artist and just all around legend. I mean, he he's the Gaga of our time. And I know Piggy, every, Piggy, everyone gives Piggy the credit, but Piggy is just really riding on his tadpole tails. I mean, you kind of said so many reasons why, but I chose like every crush has a theme. And I was like, well, what is what is Kermit? He is more than a Saturday morning cartoon. He's more than a Muppet. He is a true icon because he really does get mentioned on this show a lot more than like, or well, on the same level as boy band members and like Jonathan Taylor Thomas. So why do you think like Kermit is such an icon in like pop culture? I think because he's somebody who is able to age with us. Like we were able to like see him on like, this is the letter A and that was like new information, you know what I mean? And then take that all the way up until, well, I don't really know if I'm gonna hang with Piggy anymore. And we could like take it to complex emotions like lust and betrayal. It was really, you know, I mean, who really, that's really A to Z right there. And so, I, I, you know, he's been with me my whole life. And I think what really stands out, like you said, is he him being a leader and he has this good head on his shoulder, but, I think like he's also this moral compass of the Muppets. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think like those attributes of why you like Kermit or why like when you started dating in real life, you looked for that in like your partners? Did you try to find your Kermit? I wanted to be the Kermit that I wanted to see in the world, which is why, which, you know, is a lot of the reason. I mean, when I was a little kid, my mom had this lamp that had like fringe hanging from it. Mm -hmm. And I used to pretend that the fringe was like the curtain on the Muppet Show and like <laughs> have like, you know, little like McDonald's figurines be like Muppet Show and then like, go through, you know, like it, it, he was definitely like a blueprint for 
who I want to be and who I'd like to be with and that kind of stuff. I think maybe if anything, I, after this conversation, you might've opened up a whole new world for me, Kendra. I might be like thinking now that I have to look more for a Kermit in the world. And that might be what I should be looking for. Plus I really, I, maybe Kermit straight. We could all, we, we know that, right? So I have no actual chance with Kermit, but Kermit's into piggy. So it kind of, and, and I'm more of a fozzy. And it's kind of like, if Kermit was gay, he'd probably be with Fozzie, you know? And I think that that makes a lot of sense to me. You know what I mean? Like that that resonates with me. Kermit always hung around uh, people of size and never judged. Uh, Kermit always, you know, liked cows and bears and chickens and things. And even, no one even knows what Gonzo is. He does, he's not xenophobic. You know, like there's, <laughs> there's a lot, he has a lot of patience. There's a lot to him. There's a lot of qualities there that I think uh, uh, could make a good um, spouse. I like that you mentioned he likes piggies and all these shapes and sizes. Because I think with crushes, it's not just us like liking them. It's also seeing who they like. And I think that opens the crush up more. Because I remember like, I like Zach Morris. But seeing him kiss a black girl like Lisa. And then Sean from Boy Meets World. Like being with Angela made me like those characters so much more. Because I was like, a tra- I was like, oh, well, he's hot. And he likes someone that looks like me. So do you think like in your head, him being with Miss Piggy also like was a foundation of the crush? Look, I didn't expect this to be therapy, but maybe <laughs> like <laughs> you're you're kind of cracking open my psyche a little bit. Like it could be that. Like I mean, I definitely felt m- like Kermit would accept me a- as either a friend or a lover, d- depending. Like because Kermit was accepting of everybody, and especially in the Muppets Take Manhattan, he, n- he it's not even just his friends. Like he can't figure out what's missing and he's got every the whole gang together and he's like, what's missing? And in the end, he's like, that's exactly it. More, more animals and birds and chickens and things. Like he's like, he's like, that's it. We need more, like an abundance of love, an abundance of people, bring everybody around. I like that. I'm the kind of person, if I have a house, I'm going to have dinner parties. If I have a backyard, I'm going to have, you know, uh, barbecues. Like, you know, you know, I have a loft, so I have game nights, but like, I think that it's like, uh you know I'm, a, I'm an entertainer and i like to have people around and you know me and kermit would be a good couple if he doesn't want to date me we could be roommates i mean you don't ever know what a roommate situation could turn into just put it i mean there. you know what i'm saying if he needs a place to stay he's got he's you. like he's like it's not easy being green i'm like well let me show you a little something about me like you know what i'm saying <laughs> I also think you mentioned like the Muppets was kind of this first like behind the scenes of like the Hollywood life. Did you want to get into entertainment before you saw the Muppets or was this because the Muppet babies, they really did a lot of that's the only way I saw Wizard of Oz and Star Wars and things like that was via Muppet babies. I actually feel like I can't remember a time of my life that I didn't want to be in entertainment. Like, isn't that weird? But like, mm-hmm. I, I I entertained a very large family. I had a very large family that all lived on the same street in Brooklyn. So if I learned my ABCs, I would tour my family's coffee tables and things like that, you know? But it was always like, <laughs> I was always in awe. Like I, I did learn about like behind the scenes from that. Also from Kids Incorporated was really big for me because I saw kids like in a break room before they have to go on stage and perform. And I was like, why are these kids doing this? And I don't get to do this. like. Goonies was another one because I knew it was a movie and I, and I had seen kids like slide down slides and things like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I think like they you know, slide down a water slide into like an octopus arm by a pirate ship. I'm like, sign me up. Where are these kids getting to do this? Like, and Annie, another one, uh, definitely. But there was also a show on um, uh, Nickelodeon in the very early days of Nickelodeon. And it was hosted by Leonard Nimoy and it was called Lights, Camera, Action. And he literally took you behind the scenes of like th- three different movies every episode. And there was one movie, there was one episode in particular where they went um, behind the scenes of Never Ending Story. And they showed this scene where where the nothing covers Atreyu and he's being blown away by the wind so he holds onto a tree. And they showed you that it was done in this room that made a, made a turn upside down and he really was just hanging normally from a tree and gravity was pulling him but they moved the camera with the room and it made it look like he was flying and i was like oh my gosh they this is how they do everything everything's a trick everything's a secret and the audience doesn't know and they just get to enjoy it and i was kind of sucked in with that i think also like 
Um, you know, they had a kid who was on a stand and deliver talking about how he cried in one of the scenes, you know, just little things like that. Like, and I was like, okay, like, um, I want to do this. This is something I want to do. It's always something I wanted to do. <laughs> I like that you said you learned your ABCs and just went on a tour of uh, coffee tables. <laughs> yeah, I actually <laughs> lovingly call it the coffee table circuit. Like, I, I like <laughs> that's how I started out because my grandfather, my great great grand, my great grandfather, um, when he came to America from Italy, um, he tried to buy a house on this block in Brooklyn, and the homeowners on the block all signed off except for two houses who said they didn't want a greasy Italian to move on the block. And he saw them and he said to them, you son of a bitch, one a day, I'm going to own the whole block. And he had, uh, you know, 13 children and they all bought a house on the block. Oh my, 13? So you, 13 that is children. a big family. Just <laughs> A big, poor Catholic Italian family. And like, um, you know, they all bought houses on the block. Like the idea of making it and making your parents proud was growing up and affording a house on the block. And then... You know, that generation was my parents' generation. Like my mom was on the block, you know? Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about that is when my mom met my dad, my dad's family started moving on the block too. So my entire family, both sides were on the same street. Oh my and God, you guys just- Yeah, <laughs> so it was really crazy for me. I mean, I thought everyone lived like that, but, <laughs> but it was a unique experience for me that I think shaped me because I was the first kind of kid out of that generation and everybody talked to me and everyone talked in front of me. And if I learned something like my mom taught me a song or whatever, you know, or my cousin uh, did, uh, Diane, they would they'd be like, oh, sing that song, sing that song, sing that song. And before the night was over, I sang it 50 times to applause. Oh, <laughs> you know, at a very young age, learning how to talk and sing and do whatever. I learned that I please people by performing and that it gets this reaction out of them that brings them joy and changes their faces to smiles. And I think that that's why I've always been addicted to performing. Mm -hmm. That and a little bit of code switching, knew, knowing that I was queer and not wanting to express that, but trying to play other people, mm -hmm. especially throughout middle school and high school, being other people took the attention off of me for a minute. And people were like, well, this character is in love with this girl. And that's all I need to know. And I believe it. And it took it took it away from me having to try to prove myself or hide myself all the time. Like a lot of like LGBTQ actors get a lot of their acting experience from that code switching you were talking about. Um, there's no wonder about it. It's 100 yeah. percent. We speak about it openly amongst mm -hmm. each other often, too. That is something that. Like, that's why I'm like, don't tell me I can't play straight. I did it most of my life. Like, do you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, 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 but a lot of times, oftentimes you'll meet a, a, like a gay glass ceiling when you come out of the closet. There was several years I didn't work because like a lot of casting directors wouldn't even let me audition for parts that they deemed uh, masculine uh, coded. And I like when I, and it, you know, what's really ironic about the whole thing is um, a lot of the times when I would come against a roadblock, it would be from a queer casting director who like could sniff me out or whatever. I know that I was gay and say, no, nah, he's not right for it. You know what I mean? Without even seeing me or anything. That's why for years I stayed in the closet. I didn't go to gay clubs. I didn't want to be seen in any of those places because I didn't want to be prejudged before I was allowed in a room because that was already happening to me just from, you know, playing gay in one movie. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that. Like, especially the one movie, it's like when it's so big and it's so like known you're well, get, like, even even more than bigger known, it was yeah. really it, well, that that is a really big thing. But it was progressive. It, mm -hmm. The character was not thrown in a locker or had his head shoved in a toilet. Mm -hmm. Like he was able to breathe. And the other choices that I had of gay roles were not like that in 2004. They were just not written that way yet. Mm -hmm. I think Dam Damien and other characters like that opened the door for people to start treating gay characters more seriously. It was more like we're gonna, you know. I'm going to redo your hair or, you know, I'm going to wear mascara and a feather boa or the funny thing about me is I'm queer or I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, gay acting. That's what's funny about me instead of it just being like, I'm a funny person who happens to be gay, which I think now we're getting to see a lot more of those types of roles being written, although we are seeing a lot of them being played by straight people. Which is ironic because it's like, why can a straight person play gay, but a gay person can't play straight? So it's like, you want why? the real answer? You want the real answer? <laughs> yeah. Give the real that. answer is the world is still homophobic. So mm -hmm. yeah, that might work still here, even though we might get a pushback in the middle of the country. But then some of our like, if if um, for instance, if Elton John's movie um, Rocket Man starred a gay actor, it might not sell in. Uh, 
Asia or in Africa or, or some places ab abroad, you know? And that's actually one of the things that I found out that's so interesting about Damien is because, so Yasad Akub, who's like this incredible young, he just got his American citizenship, incredible young uh, music video director and movie director. Um, he's just like blazing on the scene, doing pretty much all your favorite Drag Race Queens videos, like Trixie Mattel and Bob the Drag Queen and what have you. And he won a Queer T Award and he came to me uh, with the word in his hand, he was tearful eyed when he came off stage and he, he found his way to me and he was like, I'm so excited to tell you this, but um, because Damien didn't um, kiss anybody in the movie or say he had a boyfriend or uh, end up with a guy at the end or even just say I'm gay, um, he made it through the censors in Dubai and it was the only gay character I ever saw that wasn't ostracized or treated poorly or sh shown as to be a shame. And I knew that I can come to America and move here and have a life. And to be in, in something as simple as a teen comedy and have it that have that kind of social impact is, you know, not lost on me. So I, that's why I think representation matters in everything I do. I think everything I do from now on, like I, the things that I feel are underrepresented are, so I'm Italian and I feel like whenever we see Italians, all we see are mafia kind of image, imagery and not like what it's like to live as an Italian. So I have an Italian mom character and I, especially because I don't feel like women are highlighted and I also don't feel like gay people are highlighted so my Italian mom character is a celebration of Italian women from a gay son and so that's like a double whammy of representation right there you know then I'm of size so that's a triple so I'm trying to figure out how can I multiply the things about me and have them represent people like I want to play things that are queer and show that you know uh, and queer guys of size can be sexualized like I was in other projects like if any project has me falling in love and it's not an issue or has mm -hmm. someone having a crush on me I'll probably take that project over another project that might pay more or maybe have a better script because I think it's so important that I'm seen in those in that way um, in a lot of ways uh, so that's something that I think is you know remarkable it's like a lot of the work I do outside of there uh, I feel like um Elizabeth Taylor, my work with the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, I'm not HIV positive, but I saw the how representation of playing an HIV positive character meant so much to erase stigma and deal with these antiquated laws. Elizabeth Taylor's main initiative right now is HIV is not a crime. And, you know, it's it, when people fall in love with characters that are telling those kind of stories on TV, they're able to be more compassionate when voting. And so it's, you know, um, as a big person being sexualized, that's a whole other thing. One of the greatest fan letters I ever got was from this guy that's like, I seen your movie like 10 years ago and I kind of forget it, you know, and I seen a, like, I haven't really seen you in much else. He's like, and I know you're on that TV show right now on HBO. He's like, but I don't, um, I've never seen it either, but don't get this twisted. This is a fan letter. He's like, I'm writing you because I was dancing on the dance floor and some guy who's way out of my league came up to me and told me, you're like my Eddie Bear. And that was my character on looking on HBO. And he goes, he goes, you're like my Eddie Bear, come with me. He's like, and we've been dating for three months. So whatever you're doing, man, keep freaking doing it, you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's what it's really about at this point. Like, I think a long time ago, I had these aspirations to be famous and I'm like, I'm already famous now. So it's like, what do I want to do now? And I think right now I'm thinking about what else can I leave behind? Like, what else can I do as legacy work? What else can I do to help move, make it easier for someone younger than me to come up and do the same things? And what else can I do right now that is positive, that puts me in a public eye, that lets people, you know, consider me for the projects that are things that I still consider aspirational that I haven't achieved yet, you know? And a lot of that's legacy work. Like with my podcast, Yas Jesus, we open up a uh, religion of all faiths up to queer people and just have a conversation about it in the comedic you know, non slut shaming way and make it fun and obtainable. And, you know, I'm also, also been working with Big Fig um, Mattress. They have uh, a collective. And, you know, I started out as like a spokesperson for them, like doing commercials and ads and stuff. But that's so much more than that. I don't think I've ever seen a company that's really um, taken the time to listen to people of size and what they feel about everything. Like they let us exasperate ourselves with ideas and with our feelings about their content and everything before they put anything out. And I think it's just so heartwarming to see that there is a, a company that is, or or that there's, and there's a group of people that are willing to give time to sort of push the envelope and make more room for people, you know, uh, and, and, and represent people.
Well, I think it's beautiful. You have the fan letters and I mean the the queerty winner. That's just like I think that's really why I love pop culture and like how it impacts like just normal people like me and just like these people sitting at home. Like I mean you guys like are, are who we have to look up to really. Like so it's great to see all the representation, especially like I'm like this little black girl and yeah, like I like seeing that. So I'm really big on on that as well. But that's wonderful. The queerty uh, thing, I that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, those are like the good moments, you know, then there's sometimes things get twisted. Like I had a little bit of an issue with the movie The Whale with uh, Brandon Fraser uh, p- playing that part, like a, a little issue with something I said being taken out of context and blown out of proportion. I actually was like happy it was because I think that it made me a part of the conversation about this. But I had I had a, I had done a great interview with People magazine. And at the very end of the interview, like after saying goodbye, even they were like, oh, one more thing. What do you think about the movie The Whale? And I was like, well, it's complicated because I'm sort of torn between it because I love Brendan Fraser. But I also think it's another straight person playing a queer person and he's wearing a fat suit. It's kind of like a double whammy, like, you know, mm-hmm. while the rest of us sit around waiting for an opportunity to be in a prestige film, you know, you can go ahead and collect your Oscar. And it sounded to me like really bitter, almost like I wish I got the role, but I, you know, quite frankly, I think I'm too young for the role, but <laughs> I do. Th- but if he's going to wear a fat suit, they get old age makeup me. But anyway, I think um, the truth was, is that like, I wanted to see some of my contemporaries, some of the elder guys that are my size, like, go up for that and maybe have an opportunity to win an Oscar, you know? Just like I wanted to see a, a gay, Elton John said, I could pick anybody I want in the world to play my part. I have full control over picking who I want. And he picked someone straight. I was like, why? Like, you know that that movie is going to get considered for an Oscar and people are going to have all these eyes on it. You could have made a gay star. Are you mm-hmm. trying to tell me no gay guy could play you? Like, you know what I'm saying? But the truth of the matter is, it wouldn't have sold overseas. It's about money a lot of the times. And I think that's the situation with Brendan Fraser. There was no gay actor, especially a gay big actor, that could have made the movie play in as many theaters as Brendan Fraser's bright star could have. But then again, it makes a choice against diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like, because this is what, uh, equality and inclusion, because this is what we're dealing with. It's like, you know, you want people to feel like they belong. And in order to do that, you have to make efforts to feel like they belong and having, somebody who's straight play gay who's traditionally been a heartthrob you know also put on a fat suit all of a sudden and we're supposed to feel bad for him and he's wearing like basically a bag of beans you know like and and i'm living this life every day as a queer you know uh larger person and i you know that's why again i go back to like my work with big fig it's like it's it's so important to think about those things like i want to be able to you know someone told told me once fat people don't sell toothpaste that was like a quote that I got once. They're like, you're gonna sell beer, you're gonna be silly, you're gonna... And one of my first commercials was like a girl, like it was hot out and I'm sitting outside and a girl walks by and I'm eating a bag of Cheetos and I wipe the sweat off my forehead and the, the Cheeto dust goes on my forehead and it says paper towels, $1.99, you know? Okay. And it was funny or whatever, but still it's a fat person eating Cheetos, looking at some a person who's hot and thinking they can't get them and then making themselves look dirty like i the joke's there and it's not lost on me it was funny and i love that commercial actually but it was for Publix. but like i feel like in the grand scheme of things there's only so many times you could be the butt of the joke before you're kind of like hey wait my teeth are white you know like why can't i why can't i do a, a, a teeth a teeth a toothpaste commercial and i think that's what's interesting about a mattress that's like four a person with a bigger figure the literal name is big fig like and all of the thought that goes inside of that and like what what that me- means to see people of all genders and races see themselves represented and you know it's so difficult doing that doing that kind of stuff i've been on tv shows where they're like you're not diverse enough and we have like the craziest diverse casts like and we work so hard on trying to include people and make people all appear and be a part of it but people judge things like, you know, so even with all those judgments, still managing, you know, we, we meet like, I think four times a year and every, and, and, and other times as well, but like we have a, like a quarterly meeting where we sit down and discuss how fat people are feeling, how bigger people are feeling and, and how this can improve the brand and how it can make them feel more included and more comfortable and more represented. When, when you talk about like the uh, plus size typecasting and all that, 
for me, like I've seen in recent years, we've seen like the self love and the body positive movement, but it seems like it's not gone or it feels like progressive. But then at the same time, I think someone in your business is seeing it as like, are we that progressive? Like, is are they just selling us this idea that we are accepting and we're just we're still not there? First of all, I think that there's a difference between body positivity that's like um, completely delirious and the person is not paying attention to their health and body acceptance and body loving and self-love. Like, I don't think that somebody should just be like, I'm, I love myself the way I am. I'm going to live the way I am. I'm not going to pay attention at all to anything I eat. I'm never going to exercise or move. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And you're going to love me no matter what, like blah. Yeah, like I think that there's a truth to that in the today, but I think everyone should be encouraged to be healthy and move forward tomorrow and make make healthy choices. It's not to say you can't have a piece of cake today, but I do think that like I don't want to perpetuate the this thing that unhealthy is beautiful. Mm -hmm. What I do think is that there's plenty of large people that are healthy and are are active and are living great lives and they're ignored and are having you know great uh, sex lives and are having. Um, are contributing to society and all this other stuff. And I, and you know, um, there was something I don't wanna uh, appropriate it, but I think it's applicable here too. So I'll give it the honor of talking about where I heard it first, but I was at Outfest Fusion, which is a, 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 a sub sex, a festival of Outfest, the LGBTQ film festival in Los Angeles, if, particularly for people who are um, of color which I think is excellent because it's a whole separate festival and they're inc everyone's included in the main festival, but this is a separate festival that is just celebrates just that. So we're able to see voices that are even more marginalized and cross-sectionally be highlighted and be shown, you know? And they were talking about trans folks in film and they were saying that we they, the trans folks need to exist in your imagination as well as in real life. That's why it's important to see trans films. And I was like, oh, this is such a, th this is applicable to people of size. Like we need to exist in your imagination as well. Like it's, it's enough to be accepted at work. It's enough to be accepted at the club and let in. And like, you know, Studio 54 days where they're like, you're fat, you can't come in. Where it's like, you know, having the kind of, now people want to be in spaces where you see everyone. If it's all one type of person, you're kind of like, I don't want to be labeled as a person who doesn't like whatever, whatever color or whatever uh, size or whatever creed a person is. Uh, you want to be in places, hopefully, um, that are like full of all kinds of people. But it's, it's a whole another thing to say, like, uh, you really do belong here and you really are, this this really is a, a place that you are, you know? And is that how you got involved with the Big Fig Collective? Like, what is your part in, in this like mighty team yeah, so, of people? So I was at a Curvy Fashionista event in Atlanta. And um, at the time I was working with a clothing line that I had and I... Um, I saw them there and they had a mattress for display and I, you know, laid on the bed and I'm like, whoa, because baby, I've broken a few beds in my day. Kermit would like, forget it. Kermit thought Piggy was a lot of trouble. You have no <laughs> idea. Uh, like, and it's never fun as a larger person mm -hmm. to break a chair or to break a bed mm -hmm. or especially a bed. It's so valuable. Like, you know, like there's been situations where stuff like that's happened. I've been at Airbnbs where I sat on the corner of a bed and I've heard like cracks or snaps, you know, um, just because especially in airbnbs people are buy, buying the cheapest things to put yeah. in their room in their room sometimes and you know they figure oh if they break it they buy it kind of situation it's just not comfortable right mm -hmm. but they were like you can you cannot break this bed and so then they asked me to do an ad for them and in the ad i improvised a jump onto the bed and it became synonymous with every with everyone jumping on this bed and all the ads now and it's been something that's like people know big fig for it, is like that you can try to destroy this bed and you can't. And it's it's amazing to me that this bed was, I mean, I am like a huge person and uh, I, I jump on this bed and nothing happens, you know, or um, it's just so amazing that it's so strong. And I think that to me, I, there's not a lot of thought put into bigger people in this world. Like if I get on an airplane, even first class can be uncomfortable sometimes, um, you know, which is insane, Like like, you know, uh, Delta One, which is like one of the most comfortable flights ever, turns into a bed and everything else. And I have to bring my own pillow because the way the the neck rest is situated, it still doesn't fit me because I'm six four. You know, I mean, I'm big and tall. You know, I'm an above average man. So the fact that somebody even thought to put thought into making something for a person like me 
it was touching, you know? And I, and when I really see, and you know, for a company that is for big people, they don't like a lot of the people that are, that are working in the company aren't big. So they really are reaching out to find out like, what does it feel like to be on this mattress? What does it feel like to touch this pillow or this blanket? And like, what's happening? And like, do you, are you comfortable? Is it long enough? Or oh, we should make one that's big or we should do this. And they're, they're constantly taking notes and trying to improve themselves and being better. Honestly, like, I want, like, I, like that's the kind of boyfriend I think Kermit would be. That's the kind of partner I think I want. And like even working and, and partnerships, like working with places like Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, my podcast, Yes Jesus, or even Big Fig, I feel like they're all places that we're trying to get better. We're trying to grow. We're trying to make the world a better place. We're trying to do things. And that's literally the kind of legacy work that I want to do now. I want someone to have a crush on me because of me, the work that I'm putting into the world to make it a better place. Like, like that. that's like what I want to be. Crush. As. <laughs> yeah, that's what I want to be known as. Because I tell you what, as a husband, I'll be making our house a better place. I'll be making our kids have a better life. I'll be, you know, building that kind of a life. Like I'm constantly about improving. Like as a partner, my biggest dream is to have my partner write a list of every single dream that they ever had in the world. And then I want to like spend my life crossing things off the list. Like mm -hmm. I'm that kind, I'm that, that's how, that's really the kind of person I am and I want to do. I want to make sure I want, I want to turn to them like renewing our vows in like 10 years and saying, look at this list. I did everything, make a new one, you know, like, and just try to figure out ways to do that. Like, that's exciting to me. Like, I feel like growing up as a person who, you know, we're all, I had a pretty good childhood and my parents are fine. Like I love my, my parents, but like, and especially my mom is like my best friend, but like, I still, you know, everyone messes their kids up somehow. It's like, we have to be, we have to work against adversary in, in order to uh, um, grow. Like, you know, if, 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 if the world, if, if everything's smooth, we'd never, you know, smooth seas never made a skilled sailor. It's like, we have to have a little bit of trouble in order to grow up as a skilled human being, you know? But if I could like, um, if I could like do anything, it would be make a life for, uh, my husband and my future, my fictional future husband, and my uh, and a, ch a fictional future child, but make a life for them that would give them the things that I never had, or experiences, or take away worries that I have, or you know, do that kind of thing. And I think you have to find somebody that you want that does that same thing for you. And I, again, I, I know I've been plugging them a lot, but I'll go back and say it's the same thing with working with like Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation or Trevor Project or working with um, Yash Jesus podcast and my team there or the people at Big Fig, everyone there is working towards embettering themselves and making the people who are experiencing those experiences live better lives and more comfortable lives. And it's like literally part of what I think the meaning of life is. And speaking of the Big Fig and what they're doing, there isn't a lot of movement in Hollywood right now because of the strike, but what is the Big Fig doing as part of their like movement? Like what's on the agenda to like for Hollywood and entertainment industry to just do better by plus size actors and people. As far as Big Fig, I know that they're creating products and expanding their product line. I know that they're doing things on their existing product. They're trying to figure out every single way. Even their ad space is gender inclusive. It's uh, color inclusive. It's sexuality inclusive. It's um, just all kinds of different things, you know, big and tall people. Um, and I really respect that. For Hollywood, I just think that like, and I say the same thing when I talk about the argument for LGBTQ people, especially trans folks. It doesn't have to, uh, um, a hotel manager doesn't have to be just like a white guy. Mm -hmm. You know, if it says hotel manager in a script, it could be a person of size. <laughs> like mm -hmm. there are people of size who are hotel managers. And I think that when they put out castings for that, they're looking for a certain thing that they have in their head is like a cookie cutter hotel manager. And I think a really good start would be some of those smaller roles, especially that are that it doesn't matter. Oh, a chef. It just says chef. Let's make the chef, a you know, a black lady of size. How great is that? Like that happens. There are there are black lady chefs. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. just like, why can't the world in, of cinema, which is supposed to be our imagination, be at least as colorful as our reality? Whereas like, I feel like our imagination world that's given to us by Hollywood is way more whitewashed and way more heteronormative than our actual world, you know, and sizest as well. 
I think that our world is so colorful. You know, the average size waist size for a man in America is uh, thirty nine point is pretty much a forty waist. That's the average waist size of a man in America. But most clothing lines only go up to a thirty eight. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like most clothing companies are not catering to the average American. So you know, yeah, maybe the, um, the food here has become poison, and they need to reevaluate our FDA, like, and reevaluate like what kind of chemicals are put into stuff, or how things are processed or prepared, because I think the rest of the country is way ahead of us in leaps and bounds, especially the UK, in ways to treat meat and things like that that we aren't doing. So there are responsibilities that don't fall on the shoulder of Americans. Although Americans, as a collective, are dealing with like, you know. Uh, uh, childhood obesity epidemic, um, you know, uh, and I think that, uh, but we are larger people. We are growing to be larger people. That is just the reality of the way it is. So in uh, until we can have our food regulated properly and things regulated properly, I also think we need to make ourselves more comfortable while we're here, while we're doing while, while we're figuring that out, you know. And I think that we also need to be more reflective in media about what that looks like. I, I it's just so strange to me that when I go and buy even now, if I want to pick up a big and tall uh, catalog to something, a lot of the people that are selling big and tall clothes aren't big and tall. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we we do have um, you know uh, awesome models like Zach Migo and stuff who like are are paving the way. But Zach will be the first to tell you that a lot of his contemporaries aren't even big and tall. You know, they're like or they're wearing the smallest size in the big and tall um, catalog in the ad. Because big and tall uh, or large people uh, images, this is what I told when I, when I was working on my clothing line is that like, like large people images, especially in catalogs and models are supposed to be considered aspirational. Mm -hmm. They want a large person to look at someone and say, I want to look like that rather than them seeing themselves and saying, that's me. And I think they're totally off base with that. And I think that's where Big Fig is doing a big change. That's why I think Big Fig is such a big fig and deal. Because what they're doing is they're saying like, we want our 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 uh, customers, we want our um, people to see themselves. And we're not thinking of them as a unit sold. We're thinking of them as a human being who is going to be sleeping and, and making love and creating babies and, and taking naps and reading a book and resting their sore bodies or recovering from a uh, sickness or whatever you do in your bed. They're going to be sp spending that time in, in our bed. And so we want to care for them and we want to make it feel comfortable. We want to make it be big enough. We want to make it be durable enough that when one person sits on one side of the bed, the other person isn't disturbed or the mattress doesn't push down all the way on the edges of the bed. like. People aren't thinking like that. There aren't a lot of companies out there that are really thinking about how to make us all more comfortable and make us all. And to me, that is something that I want to put my name on. You know, since since I learned to write my name when I was a kid, my dad said, when you put your name on something, be super proud of it so you can stand by it because your name is really all you got, you know? And so when I sign my name on something, I mean it, you know? And so I feel that way about, uh, about these organizations and about Big Fig. I feel like i'm proud to have to be an ambassador for elizabeth Taylor aids foundation or uh to be a spokesperson for a big fig because these are people these are things that are doing something to make a change about the problem there's a we, we're all aware of the problems we could sit around and say oh it's so bad about those stigmatized hiv laws but then who's doing something we're doing something and so it's like it's the same thing about saying oh you know i can never fit in the back seat of a car or my couch broke just for me sitting on it twice or three times it sucks you know, blah, blah, blah. No, Big Fig's doing something. They're making furniture and they're making items that are considering how a person like that feels and concentrating on that and not just saying it and throwing ad marketing at them, but doing real research and development and real caring thoughts into who they choose and why they're doing it. Um, I, I say all the time to uh, my agent and management team, whenever we're discussing working with Big Fig, I'm like, I just want you to know that I'm so proud to be doing this work because this company really is thinking about things on another level. I'm interested in people that are thinking, that are futurists, that are thinking about how is it gonna get better tomorrow? Not about what they gotta do today to like move units, you know? Because it's really, the, the, things are that simple, but they're not, it's, it's, it's complex. You know, we have to think, I think about even like, um, 
it was a while I was into urban gardening for a while or guerrilla gardening, which is where like, if, you know, there's a plot of land that like maybe the city forgot and you go and you throw and you go and you throw seeds there or you put a plant there. And usually they say to do it in your own neighborhood. So if you're walking by, you could water it and take care of it. But there's certain things you can't do. Like if you plant a tree, you've got to think of what that tree is going to be in a hundred years. Yeah. You could uproot like a, you, you can plant something that people don't notice for 50 years. And then all of a sudden it's ruining the sidewalk or a historical building or something else. Mm-hmm. And you're like 50 years from now, you're not even here. You're like, who cares? You know? And so you have to think about what you're doing for the future. I think that these are organizations. These are the, the, the way that I want to contribute to Hollywood. And I want to contribute to stuff that shows that, um, it's making a difference for the future. Well, I love it. I'm going to be pimping the big fig to a lot of my friends who I know I would appreciate the product product, but I do want to do a quick speed round about Kermit and yes. um, mostly musical theater. Oh, I live. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So first, what is a musical uh, theater performance that you would want to take Kermit to on a date? Maybe like Moulin Rouge, because I think it's something that's romantic and it's really fast paced. Like Kermit gets really involved. He'd probably be like, ah, during like some of the most exciting parts and it would get him a little tired and then maybe he'd be more easier to seduce. Oh, all right. All right. I like that play. Um, What is a musical that you think you and Kermit would be great as like the leading roles? I think uh, Kermit and I could star in the producers um, or a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. I could see us doing that as well. Um, I think we'd be really good in that, probably. Or maybe like a, a version of Robin Hood where he plays Robin Hood and I play Little John. I can see that. He, Robin Hood, he comes up a lot too, but I think it's only because I will mention him, but that is like one of my top tier crushes right there. The Fox. Mm. I was in, oh yeah, The Fox for sure. Gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Anyone that, could, anyone that could suck a jewel out of a ring could have my phone number. Right. That, that might have been like my child mind thinking dirty, but I was like, <laughs> That part, that part. (laughs) Maybe that's what set me off that path to watch HBO late at night when I was coming of age. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So what do you think is a musical that would be better with Muppets that they haven't done yet? Hmm. Honestly, I'd love to see Grease with all Muppets. I think it'd be really cool. I could just see like Ratso Rizzo and all his gang being like, tell me more, tell me more. Oh my, that would be so good. I hope this happens. Oh, I know. I, I want it to happen so bad. <laughs> um, oh, and this one's not musical, but because you come from Italian family, the best cuisine in the world. If you were to make Kermit an Italian meal, what would it be? Um, I would probably make meatballs, but instead of breadcrumbs, use flies. You know, he, you know, he's a frog. Oh. You got to give him what he wants. Okay. Would you wouldn't partake in the? It'd just be no, probably okay. no, probably not. No, no. But the chef never eats. That's what I would say. <laughs> and lastly. Um, if Kermit and you could connect and he left Miss Piggy and you were together, what do you think your lives would be like? Well, I definitely think that he'd be into me because frogs can switch gender parts. You know what I'm saying? But he would always still mm-hmm. be Kermit. Um, but like, I, um, I don't know. I think that it, we'd probably put on a show and figure it out from there. You'd be, you'd still be in the entertainment. Would you like ever want to retire from entertainment, get like a cottage? No, honestly, I don't like, <laughs> like, honestly, they can give my skull to like some theater for like, uh, to play Yurik in a bunch of, um, productions of Hamlet when I'm dead. I always want to be acting. Nice, nice. And then, then well, they could put you by Kermit. So, Muppet you know, an actor body. did that. An actor actually did that once, like, donated his skull to a, a theater for that purpose. Where? Um, I believe it's Chicago. I believe it was in Chicago. Like, because in Hamlet, he picks up a skull. Mm-hmm. It's like you've probably seen that in Shakespeare things where someone's holding a skull in the air. Mm-hmm. Um, and he and it was his. Uh, it was a jester who used to take care of him when he's a kid. And he he's like, oh my god. He's like, how many times this guy's been on my back? Or like, we've been playing around when we were kids and running around. And he's like, it's crazy how much. Like, then now I'm holding his head and like, how, like he's he's contemplating death. Right? It's like mm-hmm. the to be or not to be kind of thing. Uh, and um, uh, so there's always a skull in a production of, of uh, Hamlet. And so this, this actor in Chicago donated his skull to be used in further productions of Hamlet for like perpetuity. Wow. Yeah. That's- and then he gets credited in the program forever. 
I mean, if you want to be an actor, that's like a way to do it forever and live on. That's kind of cool. Kind of cool, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm not hating. Either that, that, either that, or I want people to put me like you know inside little satchels that you could just pour in your hand and go in the in the eyes of my enemies. Like the like the are you afraid of the dark dust? Like like all my friend could have them be like, did you hear Danny died? And they go, yeah, I didn't like him. And then they just go like right in their eyes yeah. <laughs> well he said fuck you and i was like, hey, like <laughs> you can bleep me you can bleep me <laughs> all right well uh before we go uh can you remind people where they can find you and the big fig collective online yes uh you can find uh you definitely can find big fig just search big fig it's going to come up all over the place it's excellent they have awesome tiktok and um social media too and mine is uh what's up danny every single place you could think of what's up danny and you'll find me well danny thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about so many important issues and your iconic uh crush with me today kermy and everyone you can find all of danny's information below and until next time as always keep crushing it Bye! <laughs> Crushgasm is part of the I Did Not Make These Rankings podcast network, alongside some other pretty cool shows, including An Evening at the Movies, Crime, Rewind, Literature Reapers, Love is Black, Masturbators, Men are the Prize, and The Sip List. You can find all of us and more over at IDNMTRpodcastnetwork.com.